I guess when in looking at our agenda, so obviously we have our, our welcome here, um, a little bit of an activity that we'll have. We'll talk a little bit about integrated design, and then we'll also uh, talk about our next steps in, in what we'll be, be working through. So on the next slide, slide three, uh, is an overview of what to expect in relation to these sessions. So we, as we were thinking through this, we were not feeling like one session would be enough. One session is just kind of to iron out some of these bugs and to get an idea of some of the framework pieces. But uh, we, we felt like about a, you know, one hour every week, highlighting a, d a few different pieces would make a lot more sense and allowing you to think through uh, where you're going with your course. So today what we'll do is listen to, a uh, to you as well at the end of uh, a bit of a presentation here and get some of the ideas and the things that you're really interested in understanding and learning about. We'll talk a little bit about just the overarching structure of thinking through course design online. And then next week, now once you have that kind of framework in your mind, <laughs> like, little echoey there. Um, so once we have done that, uh, we'll also go into idea generation. So thinking about examples from other courses, uh, lessons learned and uh, learned and tips and tricks together with moving down into now you have some ideas what does that actually look like in a course and then solidifying that approach going forward and identifying okay what do i still need to know who do i still need to contact to make this happen so that we can work with you over the rest of the summer to get these courses up and going but fourth year classes obviously as i said is very near and dear to my heart and so um I know for me, and I, I'm sure I'm not alone, thinking about the way in which I've designed my courses, which is here, do a bunch of readings, do a few activities, come to class, and I don't lecture, we just talk and we go through the content and really dive into it deeply. I've really had to reframe and rethink of how, how I do that, so I hope that we're able to work through that here together in the next few weeks. Uh, so on the next slide, I'll have Mark show you uh, a little bit of one of the activities that we can do uh, with the class. Right. So um, as I mentioned a little earlier on, uh, we are or we, we should be able to actually interact with uh, the slides that are being presented to us here in a way that may have been difficult in past with um, somebody showing us a PowerPoint on a, a video conference or in, in the front of a room. Um, so, so you should be able to click upon the please join us in our Etherpad link uh, that's uh, near the bottom of the slide. Uh, and you, you're very encouraged to do so, in fact, because uh, this will allow um, everyone who's here today to uh, contribute uh, and as well help us understand a little bit about what, uh, what your hopes and dreams are around uh, what we're able to achieve in these sessions and to get a sense of the specific courses that, uh, that you've got ahead of you. Uh, you are, uh, after clicking upon that link, prompted to uh, choose how you'd like to access the um, the collaborative document or the Etherpad. Uh, do feel free to log in honestly with whatever ID you would like. Uh, the easiest way in could simply be the first part of your Brock email. And you will see that there is some capacity to collide with one another here. Uh, that's the both the nature and excitement of uh, of an Etherpad. Don't see the link here. Uh, perhaps I can link it within the chat. Thanks for letting me know, Bracket. Um, so if you're unable to click upon the link that's presented on the slide, there is also a, a direct link available in the chat. Uh, and the chat, uh, if you've not opened it yet, uh, is one of the buttons that uh, can be clicked upon after kind of moving your mouse around and um, um, finding the little speech bubble icon that on your screen I think is going to be located right around here. So this is a tool that um, 
I have looked at and thought through how do I use this almost as like what I would do with a whiteboard in my classroom. So oftentimes I have my students come in for the first part of the class is 15 minutes of what were your key learnings, write that up on a board. Uh, what were your biggest challenges in your project this week? They write that up and then we have a discussion about that. So this might be a way in which in your fourth year class to just get that conversation started. If you were to do a, some level of a one hour synchronous um, situation with your students, pull up this etherpad and get going. It is pretty quick. If you go over to the right hand side, you can see the a little icon with the people. And if you click down, you'll see who's what color. So uh, some of the colors sort of collide, like uh, Mark has said, but mm -hmm. um, you can definitely see who's writing in there and what people are kind of talking about and use that as a really quick way to have a discussion uh, with somewhat of a bigger team. Mm -hmm. It's um, an early and somewhat open source and stream, streamlined uh, take on uh, Google Docs or Word Online or or that kind of a of a technology offering, and it's it's been quite handy amongst some communities, including uh, the Sakai community, as it happens uh, for our little mini meetings that we have several times monthly. So, Mark, can you tell us a little bit about how this is linked into Sakai and into a course? So what would an instructor need to do to get that type of uh, link? Just a quick overview. <laughs> Appreciate that, Madeline. Um, <laughs> so e Etherpads is, is actually a tool that's been available in Sakai uh, for at least about five or six years now. Uh, it tends to be very handy for uh, collaborative work amongst small to medium sized groups um, and I would certainly qualify a group today to fit kind of right in the middle of that uh, that category. Uh, when one enables new tools within a Sakai site, so um, I, I'm, I'm certain that um, most folks within this workshop have switched something on uh, in Sakai at, at some point in the last few years uh, after uh, gaining access to a site, so that's uh, site info manage uh, tools and the kind of bottom quiet space at the uh, um, or the space down at the bottom of that list uh, is an external tools area with etherpads uh, as an option. Once that's switched on, it will appear in your Sakai site on the left toolbar. Um, and as the instructor, it will give you the opportunity to very quickly spin up um, etherpads like this, or, or I guess just pads or uh, however you'd like to describe it. That can be um, strategically shared out to your students or to small groups of students uh, through other tools within your site or simply through the etherpad tool within Sakai. And so if you needed any thoughts, and if you really like this tool, uh, Mark uh, is able to help you figure out how to link that into your class. So as I'm looking through this, I'm seeing that um, where a lot of people are between about 10 to 30 people in their small group classes. A lot of people thinking about a little bit of both, of doing some synchronous and some asynchronous. Uh, a lot of the students looking to, uh, th that are very engaged students and they're very much capstone uh, types of courses. So this is really great information for us and we'll be able to use this and integrate some of this into our, our next sessions as we move on. So um, you keep going if you want to keep typing into that to let us know a few more things, but I will go on to the next slide and just keep uh, going through our presentation. So on the next slide, um, what I wanted to just talk about is this idea of the reframing for the online course design. And uh, I think this is a, a really important piece. It's, it's really hard to just take what we've done and just set it into an online environment. We really can't do that. So we want to be able to think about what are those learning objectives that are really key for our course. We need to reimagine what does that course assessment look like to be able to achieve that. And then in terms of the way we deliver those, those teaching activities, I kind of framed it as the need to haves and the nice to haves. I think there's a lot of nice to haves that I've had in some of my courses that I, I it's really nice to, to be in person and be able to, um, to do a, a lecture or to have a guest speaker come in. Those are great things, but what are the things that I really need to have at this time and focusing in on those to make sure that happens. And then Mark, you were gonna speak to learning equity here. Right. Um 
and I I don't want to be too too drawn out about it. Um, one of the uh, I think it, interesting things to address now that we've um, made a made a grand pivot uh, to online delivery is uh, considerations of folks that are learning from a rural environment uh, who may um, actually not have very good internet connectivity, uh, if any at all, or may simply not have constant availability uh, of internet connectivity, uh, or those who have a, a complex learning environment. So for example, parents that have uh, childcare responsibilities that may previously have been able to address that by um, attending a, a brick and mortar course uh, and thus um, having someone uh, watch their child or children for a little while, uh, that may be impossible in the current context, in which case, uh, it may be challenging to arrange to have, uh, a, a, again, busy parents or folks with uh, not great internet connections attend synchronous learning opportunities like this uh, in that same moment and together. Uh, and so building your course around a little bit of flexibility uh, so that students are able to maybe strategize when their learning happens around all of the, uh, the other challenges um, or uh, dynamics of their lives uh, can be helpful, especially in an online format. For sure. So then um, our next slide here speaks to a, a little bit about that as well, is that uh, I know from the Brock perspective, we have been pushing and, you know, saying that we really need to think about this asynchronous learning. So making it things that students can do at their own time, they engage in maybe pre-recorded videos, collaborative group projects on their own time again, maybe there's lesson projects, there's reflective assignments. And then the flip side being that synchronous learning where we're having live chats and live discussions and course-wide assessments um, together. And I guess for me, uh, you know, the thought of not actually seeing and interacting with my students in a fourth year class is it doesn't even seem like I could do that. I feel like there's a way in which we need to have some level of engagement and coming together to really share and think through ideas. And so there's that sort of middle ground where we are able to be the people who cur curate, if I were to use that term, uh, some of the best content and, and learning activities for students to understand the content. And then thinking strategically about that middle ground of where can we come together to have some of that synchronous learning and what might that look like? Some of that could look like uh, live chatting through a forum. So you don't have to use Teams, <laughs> which some people are not loving, um, or you could use life size, of course, but, or it might be that if you have a class of say 30 and you still have that three hour block that's been somewhat scheduled, then you maybe bring in 15 students for small group discussion for one hour and then the 15 other students at another hour so that you can still have some of this synchronous type of engagement. Or again, it could just be sort of a live chat through a forum. So there's some synchronous aspect and engagement and thought provoking ideas that are brought through when you're in this fourth year class. So on the next slide, this one for me speaks to um, how to take all of this information and all the things that you're thinking about and put them into some boxes to, to make sense of how to create your courses online. So having your learning goals, so your course learning outcomes, we'll talk a little bit more about those in a bit, is the first key. What are the things that you really need your students to get out of the course? Then what are those learning activities? So is it videos? Uh, what types of, of interaction do they need to have to learn the material? And then from there, aligning um, the, the actual assessments to that. And Heather, absolutely. We're actually, we will, we will share these slides um, as well as have a video about these that will be able to be posted. So when you're thinking about this integrated learning design, you also want to come back to understanding the situational factors. So Mark, if you flip to the next slide there, it speaks to uh, the context. So thinking about who are your learners, and that was uh, one of the questions, and I, I point here because this is my other screen, um, is 
thinking about who your learners are and what do you really want them to know? What do you want them to be able to do? What do you want them to be able to value by the end of this fourth year class? And that is something that I often, you know, I hadn't thought about for a while. And then I sat back and reflected and say, you know, by the end of this course, for me, what I want my students to be able to do is to be able to think differently about health professions, but to also understand how the system impacts community health. And I thought, wow, you know, like if that's really what I want them to walk away with, then what are those types of learning activities they need? And how do I assess them? Is an exam going to be able to understand what their value is? Or what else is it that I can do to allow them to demonstrate that they've learned this and they understand those aspects that I want them to, um, to achieve? So almost having this mission statement, this value statement that you have around your course can really help to guide what are those most important pieces that you want to integrate into your course. So on the next slide, we uh, have broken down a little bit around Bloom's taxonomy. And I'm sure if uh, everybody was in the room, they'd be like, yeah, yeah, I know what that is. But for, for me, I just wanted to come back to this and ground it and saying that in our fourth year, we're generally at the top, right? Here where we're thinking about how do our students analyze, potentially apply, but analyze, evaluate, and really create new knowledge. And if we will also put uh, we will put a link to this on our I think I have it here. Let me just see. Yeah, um, here's a link to some of the information related to the taxonomy in our CPI website as well that will help you to look at your learning outcomes now and maybe recreate them using some of this language around what you want them to achieve. So on the next uh, the piece there, this is again another lovely visual from our in 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 CPI uh, artist Julia, who has been able to really think about these pieces and put them together in a nice visual. So that's available for you to see these words and and create your course learning outcomes. On the next uh, slide here, we have the next piece of. You've created these great learning outcomes, but what are the activities that you're going to do to allow them to achieve that? In class, again, what I would generally do is I would put them in small groups. I would have them air media up to the screens because I'd always ask for that one really fun room. And I would have them collaborate and do collaborative presentations. I would have them maybe watch a video in class. I might also have them uh, talk about a reading and we would discuss that. And I was like, okay, how do I do all these things in an online environment? And I think it's possible and I know it's possible. So these are the activities that you want to bring into each of your curated areas of content uh, within a lesson, say for each week, or you could modulize that. So uh, I'll show you in a minute what I've done with one of my classes where the focus is on leadership and change. So for one month, they have four modules that are focused in on leadership. So it's not uh, it, it's not seen as like a, a lecture. It's seen as here's this week, you're gonna talk about this topic and I've curated the information I want to, for them to have there. And then you move into the next part. And then at the end of that module, I do an actual assessment. So what are the learning activities are the things that you wanna think about? And on the next slide, maybe that is where I was gonna talk about my uh, course, is it Mark? Yes, it is. so here's an example. And if people click on this, can they get to my course, Mark? They, they won't be able to um, uh, because it, it's still yours, but I'm, I'm happy to um, to do uh, a share of uh, and to show it off a little bit on my screen if that works with everyone. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. You can pull it up and I'll just give people a quick overview. Mm -hmm. yeah. So with this course, it is a um, it is a, a master's course, but essentially I see it as it's a it's a small group type of class. And the way that I have organized it is through the lessons tab. So if you haven't used lessons, honestly, absolute savior. Love this. Uh, if you click on the intro one, I'll just give a quick overview of that one. So what I did for uh, students, because again, you're not seeing them in person. This is almost that first week of class where you talk about the course outline. And uh, what you can do is you can create these great columns, you can create a really nice checklist. And then as you scroll down, what I did is I always put in a learning ob uh, objectives. 
And then here I just made an overview video. So I wanted my students to actually know who I was. I, we're not going to play that video, but you know, it's there. Um, I did a video about this is who I am. This is what my expertise that I bring to this course. And then I also did a piece where I had my teaching assistant, Caitlin Mull, who uh, did a bit of a video as well. And then the course outline was connected there. I did a pre-recorded kind of voiceover piece about uh, what the course was going to be about, just looking at each of the assignments and then broke that down a little further. You can keep going. I think these are just like two minute, really quick videos just to get them going. And then at the end, what I did is I just provided them with a bit of a discussion forum. Do you have any questions? And then tell me a little bit about yourself. And so this allowed the, the class to actually see who was in, uh, in the course. And that was done in one of the forums. And so that for me was really just uh, the first kind of step. If you wanna to go to one of the lessons that's open there, uh, Mark, and so on the, the left there, you can see all the different lessons that I have. And the ones that are a little bit more bolded are the ones that are actually already open for the students it's because I curated them in a way that it's like, this is about leadership for this module. So for here, I've done something very similar and tried to keep it kind of maintained in a way that is consistent for the students to go move through that material. So going down, I've, there's a lot to read, but these are, it's really narrative from my sense, almost like I'm teaching a lecture <laughs> in terms of talking about those uh, key concepts and then giving them questions to consider. And then at the end, I kind of make it in a different color as well. I think that people see that and they're like, oh, okay, now I know this is what this section does. And these, were, these are more uh, reflective and thought-provoking types of activities that they could engage in. So this is how I'm envisioning what could be possible in a lot of our fourth year classes is curating the information you want them to see and want them to understand. And then after this piece, you're using that individuals could think about, okay, could I use an actual uh, for, uh, forum to have a real-time discussion? Or could I bring 10 students together to actually discuss the readings that we uh, were involved in here? So those are the learning activities that we would be doing in terms of trying to uh, create um, the knowledge and the understanding of the topics. So again, this is just a, a, an example of what I've done and how I've sort of set it up to make sense of the material as they move through the semester. And then if you go back, Mark, to our PowerPoint. Okay. Thanks for throwing that up there. Um, has the PowerPoint been regenerated on everyone's screen or are you still awaiting I'm that? seeing you. I don't Just have it. OK, OK. Um, there are several methods of sharing here um, that uh, I'm there still putting my mind around. OK, well, let's catch back up to where we were. There you go. Awesome. So I guess in coming back to that integrated design approach, we have our learning outcomes. You have the activities you want to, them to do to understand the material and to engage. And then uh, the next set of the next slide here is about assessment. So I'm going to throw this one over to Mark to discuss the next two slides. Right. Um... So, and actually, I think that this, uh, what we were able to see in Madeline's course, uh, in particular uh, with usage of the lessons tool, allows us to segue a little bit into this uh, quite nicely. Um, and we had a, a bit of a nerdy discussion, uh, I think, yesterday about the difference between activities and assessment in courses. And we have different opinions about how closely those should be aligned and overlapping. But uh, at any rate, uh, there, I, I agree there are some distinctions. Uh, what's handy is that a lot of the assessments that that may have existed in courses before, uh, in particular uh, third and fourth year and grad level courses, uh, can certainly still be uh, undertaken in advance in a, in a fully online environment. Uh, these are uh, some some fairly high level examples here. Uh, high level meaning they're they're intentionally generic, but uh, I, I do hope to have some time towards the end of our discussion to perhaps explore some Sakai specific examples with all the buttons and toggles and things like that. Um, but I do want to stress, for example, that uh, there are some interesting video assignment options available now 
in uh, conjunction with Sakai sites uh, and, and as well outside of Sakai. Uh, doing video assignments on the student side or even on the instructor side uh, in terms of your video creation is quite a bit easier than it's ever been before. Uh, and we're, we're very thankful for that. Uh, we've worked very hard in CPI to find our, ourselves with a platform that uh, we, we both trust and feel is uh, approachable. Uh, there are opportunities for students to blog, not necessarily uh, with external blogs uh, like WordPress, um, or um, some of the other more, more popular options, but uh, th there are features within Sakai that allow for um, private or semi-private sharing amongst students, and as well there uh, are wiki assignments that can be explored, all within the Brock environment. Uh, certainly there are lots and lots of options for collaborative group work. If you do have a bit of comfort with all of these new technologies that we've very quickly um, been forced to become friendly with, uh, Microsoft Teams is an excellent collaborative space for small groups. That's uh, something that I'm, I'd be very happy to speak with you with if you'd like to explore it for student work. Um, does require a little bit of support though, of course. But there are spaces within Sakai that uh, may be a little bit traditional, like the forums tool that can work quite well for that, uh, or uh, a, a sort of halfway point uh, like a little bit of teams a little bit of sakai and as well a, a little bit of allowing students to choose their own um, external service that they still prefer to communicate uh, within and that, that could certainly be snapchat gmail and, and so forth uh, giving students the ability to make those choices on their own uh, let's not forget high frequency testing in an online environment uh, that is excellent because it uh, requires a little bit of, I, I think, upfront work on the instructor side. But once your tests, whether or not you're doing it through the, the testing tool uh, or something different like Microsoft Forms, with a little bit of front loaded work uh, on, I suppose, on, on the professorial side, students are able to, on a weekly, chapterly, termly basis, uh, whatever, able to check their own understanding of what's been going on as far as uh, knowledge acquisition in the course and as well once you've done that setting up allow it to be mostly automatically graded and moving forward have the ability to use those assessments in future offerings of the course with uh, of course with some modifications as time goes on um, but with a lot of the original bones kind of still in place uh, uh, Another interesting discussion I think we've been having uh, again to, as to uh, work towards our, our grand pivot has been how do we allow students to demonstrate the work that either had to use analog technologies like uh, long form mathematics or students that are doing visualized work, whether that is quite literally within the visual arts uh, or, or something that um, exists between uh, the, the humanities and the social sciences and so forth that might be difficult to express in a, with a, a thoroughly digital medium, allowing students to photograph the work that they're, they're doing and then submitting it through the assignments tool or otherwise to you in a way uh, with which you're comfortable uh, can be a useful middle ground. Uh, we are certainly making strides in terms of other platforms that are specialized towards this, but for the moment, uh, this might be a handy solution to investigate. Um, and then let's not forget the forums tool and the assignments tool for the, the relatively traditional assignments that I don't think are strangers to us. Uh, the forums tool is still excellent for long form discussions and critical exploration of, uh, of course, topics, uh, despite it existing for, a, I, I think, ne nearly about three decades as a popular medium at this point. It's still a useful teaching tool and is something that, um, that we would recommend. And lastly, don't forget about uh, essay assignments. And those, those are still, of course, very easily brought into a digital space. <clears throat> uh, so on the feedback side, and this this slide mainly addresses the, the, in, the instructorly or uh, the, uh, I suppose, marker grader side of, uh, of course administration. There, you'll note that there is a note here, in fact, uh, that reverses that, that I'm excited to get to. Uh, on the authentic assessment side, so in, in that scenario where students have generated either an audio or a video assignment for you, um, there is good reason to think that perhaps 
your most genuine assessment of that work may also need to be expressed in an audio or a video format. This, this is um, a step that uh, folks in CPR are happy to help with. Uh, but one thing I, that I would say up front is that, again, that creation of content like this is a lot more approachable uh, and I think uh, is possessing of far fewer steps than it's been uh, in some years. Uh, and I, I do recommend exploring it, I think, in a lot of different contexts. Uh, as well, uh, it's interesting to explore on a weekly basis, in particular when you're forced to interact with your students in a fully digital environment, the opportunity to create a short video uh, posted to the Sakai site or whatever space you're choosing to uh, to, to offer up um, your, your course's content or to communicate with students. Uh, a weekly check-in that allows students to see you, understands that uh, there, there is in fact still very much a human being on the other side of this course, uh, and to address what's gone on specifically within that past week or that past um, subject or chapter within that course. Uh, and when handy, in fact, even to refer to some aspects of discussion that have gone on and to refer to, uh, to students by name. Uh, this has really shown um, to help students feel an instructor presence within the course, to feel that there is some legitimacy to the work that's gone on. Uh, let's not forget about peer evaluation. There are uh, a number of different ways to undergo that. Uh, there is, uh, if, and I, I think just to call it the attractive nuisance that does exist, there is a tool within Sakai in the assignments tool called peer evaluation. I do not encourage using that tool. Uh, my apologies if you've explored it temporarily. It is, it, there's a transparency problem with it that uh, I, I don't think is very handy. Uh, that said, there are lots of interesting options within the lessons tool, in fact, to facilitate peer evaluation. Uh, and there are more, I think, traditional ways of going about it as well, like post group project evaluation forms that can be made part of the assignments waiting itself. Uh, that allow students to relatively anonymously, um, of course it wouldn't be anonymous to you as an instructor of the course, uh, evaluate the work that, that uh, their other group members have done. Um, with a direct connection to the, the bit that I mentioned in the previous slide around high frequency uh, testing or assessment, uh, there is I think some advantage to relying when appropriate on automated grading that can exist uh, in particular within the tests and quizzes tool within Sakai. Uh, and as I noted before, Microsoft Forms can also undertake a relatively quick and um, I think fairly streamlined and dynamic feeling tests uh, and uh, graded automatically for you. And there are lots of textual feedback options available within Sakai, as you may have experienced. If uh, communicating with students in other formats like email, and I think that there are lots of contexts where that can still make sense, and in fact can perhaps feel more communal, uh, that can still be an option. Uh, there are lots of interesting and more, I suppose, modern communication opportunities within Microsoft Teams. If that is um, a bridge you'd like to travel across, we're happy to go there with you, uh, although There'll be lots of questions beforehand. Uh, and then lastly, and this I think has been an interesting opportunity in particular in an online environment, is the opportunity to um, solicit formative feedback from your students about how the course has been going. Uh, we're in an online format, giving students a very approachable and quick opportunity to anonymously evaluate how the course has gone for them so far might be handy. This can be something as simple as uh, what needs to keep happening in the course, what should stop, and what should start in this course, uh, and then allowing students to communicate that to you through, uh, again, an anonymous form in Microsoft Teams, or if you are comfortable with uh, Qualtrics, for example, is another option that Brock has freely available. Uh, and you'll note the italics at the bottom of the page. Uh, rubrics are very handy. Uh, <laughs> Educational developers in CPI are very happy to help you uh, develop rubrics for your assignments. And as well, uh, we've got a number of examples that we're happy to pass on. Uh, 
Excellent. So thanks, Mark. Um, and I know that we only have 15 minutes left, but uh, we, we've got through quite a bit so far uh, and we want to be able to open it up for some discussion and for uh, any comments you want to put into the chat. So just as we're, we're wrapping up here, the goal today was really just to get you thinking about how do I start structuring and what does that look like and, and sort of get the, get the wheels turning. The next uh, session that we'll do will be focused in on providing you with more examples, more tips and tricks, providing you with those links to things that you need. We're gonna be looking through the etherpad and seeing if there's anything in there that we can pull out and make sure that we, we bring in here if there's some themes that people are talking about. Um, so really right now, what I would like to do is just open it up uh, to the group. As you'll see, there is a, a raise your hand option. So you can see that your hand has been raised and you can lower it as well. Or if you don't wanna speak, uh, you're more than welcome to just throw it in the chat, throw a question in the chat there and we'll be able to, um, to answer those questions. If you have to sign off right now, I totally understand. Hopefully you've been able to get some good information. And if uh, you did decide obviously if you're coming next week tell your friends if you think that it might be something that they would uh, benefit from as well so I do see that there's a few hands up so we'll start with Brecket because I think you were first go ahead all right okay and you can see me now too I guess yep. not very well not very well never mind okay okay so actually I have two things one is is technical um and, and it's when I see my screen on, on Teams, I have at the bottom this sort of the, the, the menu thing where, you know, you hit the, the hand or the share screen or the how do I make this disappear? Because it covers up your slide. Oh, that's covering your slide as well. Um, what I found to be handy because I have that problem as well is to resist the, uh, the temptation to move my mouse around. Uh, because after a time, Teams, which is attempting to make this whole thing feel um, dynamic to you, should allow that button to disappear. Um, but it didn't. I sat here for half an hour. It didn't. No. Okay. Okay. So I, I figured there must be another way. Let me see. Anyway. Okay. All right. That's a technical issue. But um, I, and now I have, I, I think, a bigger one. Okay, so I'm going to be honest with you. I, I do have some experience with online teaching, more a blended course, and it's fine. And I feel relatively comfortable, although I don't think I've been successful. But I have to tell you that with all these incredible possibilities that you have thrown at us, and this is not the, even the first time that I see many of these possibilities, to me, it is overwhelming. I'm sure for other people it may not be, but for me, it is overwhelming. And I, I know that's not the intention. So I'm going to ask you a question. Out of all these tools and possibilities and options that you have introduced to us, if I asked you to recommend one thing that I should implement in my course in September, one thing, what would it be? So I'll give my one thing and then I'm going to let Mark give his. Um, okay, make sure it's the same one, you yeah, know. <laughs> well, <laughs> it might be different. Maybe you get two things. But I would say my one thing is using the lessons tool to make things streamlined and consistent for the students every single week. And that seems to work really fabulously just because they know what to expect when they come to do my class whenever that is at midnight at you know whenever they do their their learning they know what to expect each time they get a lesson and um that would be my one big piece is the lessons and also i'll, I'll give you one other thing though is <laughs> yes. at some point there has to be some level of not not synchronous but they need to see me as the instructor yeah. somehow if it's just that intro video and maybe every other week I do a quick little just you know say hey what's going on this is what I think or something happened in the media this week that links to our course 
just that, you know, often, not often, but that li little bit of connection throughout the semester really makes them feel connected. So I'd say lessons and figure out strategically. I do biweekly videos because I don't think they want to see me every week. Um, but biweekly five minute videos uh, is is enough. And I think that kind of interaction is what I've heard from students is helpful. So those are, sorry, that's my two things. Mark, you get one now. <laughs> uh, I, uh, be sitting on the knife display that I apparently am right now, um, I will either lean, um, I think, towards one or the other. I, I th they're both excellent. Um, and I think just to underscore what Madeline mentioned about um, a, a relatively approachable opportunity to let you show to your students that, that this course is not on autopilot. It's not a MOOC. Uh, it's not being recycled again and again, term after term, uh, which are some criticisms, I think rightly, that students have, uh, that everyone has of online learning in some contexts. Um, but um, taking a moment to spin up a quick video uh, and, uh, and, and I wouldn't want to urge or, or, or um, I think I, should, I, I would urge you not to go down that road of judgment around video quality and um, be concerned about what student expectations um, might be, uh, because actually these are lots of discussions that I've had with folks recently. Um, and, and if we think about what students are consuming at the moment, TikTok videos and Snapchat videos, uh, there is not a strong quality aspect to those. <laughs> uh, what what I think is benefit about those is their immediacy and it is uh, maybe at some level, from some perspectives, the capacity for quick connection. That's something that we've actually got the tools to really easily do. Um, if you've got a mobile device, for example, a phone, um, you are able to make a, a fast minute and a half of video on a weekly basis for students from a technical perspective. Uh, I or uh, a member of uh, the EdTech team would be really happy to work with you to just kind of talk through it if that interests. Um, on the other side of that, uh, that spectrum, uh, and again, th th this is me underscoring some of Madeline's points, what lessons tool can, the, the lessons tool or any kind of like online module building thing, um, lessons is what Sakai offers up, but if you've used other LMSs, it goes by other names. Uh, what we lose in an online environment is your ability to organically be present in the classroom and to steward students through um, in in a way that um, that is kind of ingrained uh, and I think as as folks who have instructed um, you you know how you can sense when a student uh, perhaps needs additional input when uh, something needs clarification or if uh, or if the whole thing's going awry and of course in an online environment it's kind of harder to spot that um, so adding those for lack of a better term, uh, and rails uh, that I think a module can provide will help students self-guide uh, perhaps more effectively, still with some support from the instructor. Uh, so I guess I have to throw my hat behind two things. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Brett. Uh, the, yes. the second you one see? is... Uh, you see? Yeah. I, and I, do. I think um, um, just around that too is the idea of, you know, keep it simple uh, is, is the key. We don't need all the bells and whistles to make everything really super fancy. You got to think, you want to think about what do you want them to learn and what are the best ways for them to learn. And if you haven't done all these other really fancy things in your face to face, maybe that's not needed here. Maybe it is just some curated great readings and a few times for some really good discussion on forums and in person. So I think that's key. Now I'm going to jump over because there's two more questions here. Uh, I don't know who had their hand up first, but I'll go with Carol. She's at the top of the list and then we'll go to you Donna. So Kara. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, have you used that software Snagit and how does that differ from this universal capture or or um, PowerPoint narrating or things like that? I'm just wondering if I should purchase the Snagit because I've heard a lot about it. That's yours, Mark. <laughs> mm, um, I almost need a 
a comparison table. Um, <laughs> yes. And you know what? This would be a great one to actually demonstrate next week is, you know, snag it as compared to um, the other pieces. So we can definitely put that on our list. But if you want to give us a quick overview, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, they all do relatively similar things. Uh, what I think as far as what Universal Capture and Snagit have in common is that they are happy to just record what's on your screen and mm -hmm. as well what you're saying and then turn it all into a video. Okay. Um, and so that if you've got a, a, a multiple inputs uh, kind of lecture that you've got uh, in mind. So if, if you'd like to peruse a website or have something expressed just on your computer screen uh, mm -hmm. that you'd like to discuss with students, Again, either Snagit or Universal Capture are handy. Um, and to make it more complicated, uh, what PowerPoint and Universal Capture have in common that Snagit doesn't is that both are very easily able to capture an image of you alongside um, what's on your screen and what you're teaching. Um, well, so well, actually, that's fancy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Universal Capture does all three. Uh, okay. And it's something that, uh, as a Brock person, you've got access to uh, without w without obstacle as far as needing to get an additional license or anything like that. Um, through a series of links, you're able to download it and uh, add it to your computer and get going. Uh, yeah. Certainly, um, a webcam and those kinds of things are necessary in order to record you. It's mm -hmm. not mandatory that you do. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's handy and I and I could see as well that that Madeline I think agrees based on some of the videos that I could see in her site that we that we all checked out just now uh, it allowing students to understand that there there is a human on the other side of uh, of that theory is, is is really useful in this context but I have a MacBook so it just does that it's able to just record mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Right. so um, yeah, so around that, I think that'll be something that we can give a little bit of a demo of maybe those differences and, and demonstrate how uh, easy that is. And just to some of the, the points about making a video and uploading it, uh, the intro video, I had my daughter just videotaped me outside for my intro on my phone. It goes to an app, it goes straight into my Sakai and I had it uploaded in like 10 minutes. It's so there's things that are super easy through our, our allowed platforms where Snagit might be a little bit more complex because it's not specifically LinkedIn, but Mark can talk about that piece next week. Now there's a few uh, other quick questions here. So Donna, you had one as well. You, you might be muted, Donna. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, my taskbar to unmute myself disappeared and I don't know why it's back now. Hi, thanks Madeline. Thanks Mark. Um, quick question Madeline, could I have access through Sakai to look at the course that you had for an example? Your lessons tool seemed so well laid out. I wondered if I could peruse through that or if there's another site that you could let me have access to. Yeah, absolutely. I That was my uh, task for today was to make it a joinable site. So on our CPI website, and I'll make sure I put that in here into the uh, chat, is I don't think it is a joinable site right now, but I can make it one and I, I wanted to do that. So I will make sure you have a joinable site. <laughs> Thank you. That's it. Thanks. And just uh, that said, uh, there are a few other sites uh, that are joinable on a CPI. All you have to do is when you're in your own Sakai site, you can join them and you can see how other people have laid out their lessons okay. and it might give you some other ideas as well. So we'll make sure that that link is uh, provided to you. Did you put that in there, uh, Mark? You probably have a better idea of where that is than I do. Working on it. Um, and okay. that's... <laughs> Creating an online course, I think, is what you've got in mind. Is that right, Madeline? I think so, yeah. But uh, regardless, we can send it out in an email as well. Um, I do see there's one other uh, question here from Elizabeth. It says, my question about how, uh, about what we can do if students have uneven access. So uneven access in terms of um, maybe to internet, I think was maybe the question. Um, yeah, sorry. I. 
my hand isn't showing up, so I had to ask the question that way. And uh, I'd appreciate it if you could let me know how to get the hand to uh, turn up because it's nowhere. But yeah, I've I already had that problem on the past term that some students um, they were in homes with a lot of other people, so they couldn't always access the internet, or they were far away, or you know they have other um, demands, especially if they're you know at home and distance. A lot of them are going to be doing other types of things or not be able to get online or not have the equipment they need to do certain things. So it's how we design courses where they're they're not left out, um, while at the same time also being able to challenge you know, the ones who do have access. I mean, how does this limit what we can do? Absolutely. And I know we've been looking at this from the spectrum, spectrum of students that don't even have computers or, or access. And I know that IT has been working through a number of strategies around that to a point where, you know, like I had my own son was running in the room here when I was, uh, you know, doing a presentation. And so what does that look like for some students? And I think that's a little bit of getting to know your students, but uh, that's hard when you're trying to design a course for now. So for me, thinking about that in a flexible way, especially for this for this fall term and saying, okay, if Jenny is just not able to be online for a, in a synchronous or for a synchronous discussion with the 10 uh, students that I would like her to be, what's something else that she can do it, uh, to ensure she achieves those learning outcomes that um, I feel are part of that synchronous uh, piece? I, I think we have to be flexible. We just have to be compassionate and, and thinking about you know meeting students where they're at and understanding how we can ensure they still have a good experience. But again, you know, I wish I had this fabulous ex um, a fabulous explanation for what we can do, but I think we just have to be flexible around these kind of pieces. Uh, any other questions? I know it's a little bit after two, but I, I know there's a few people that are still on. If there's any uh, kind of remaining things, we've still got a few minutes. Um, otherwise, uh, we will have another session next week. We're going to curate the list here and figure out what are some of the pieces that might make sense for our session next week, but definitely have some more examples, some more trip, tips and tricks, and also some lessons learned uh, that we'll be able to share. So thanks so much for everybody uh, being here and obviously being passionate about the, the student experience. And uh, I know that's why you've been here. So thanks so much.